Right. So good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for this brilliant opportunity to be able to um, chat to everybody today. Um, and I think this is something, a, a topic that's quite close to my heart and something that we, we actually see very often and in our everyday practice. Um, so I think it's really great that one can actually talk about this topic. Because I think the reality with our pets these days is that I think we can safely say that most pets will, at some point in their lives, have to travel. Um, whether this is going on outings, because we know that these days our pets are, are often moving into a position of the family where they are actually part of the family. They're not just uh, a dog or a cat that's just around. They're actually becoming part of the family. They are taken on holidays. Um, when people travel overseas, when people uh, eric, uh, immigrate, they go with. So uh, pet traveling has become quite common. It's become an everyday occurrence. Um, we have pets that go to daycare every day because they might be stressed at home or they might um, just be a little dog that, that is maybe not safe to be by himself at home. Um, and then finally, the big thing is, yes, most pets do at some point visit us as vets. Um, and to be honest, it's not nice um, receiving a pet and knowing that they've been super stressed in the car or you can see this little kitty cat that has just been, been sort of shoved very unceremoniously into the cat box and you know they hate it and they can't stand it. And it is definitely something that if we can avoid these sort of stresses, um, it, it is really nice to be able to do that. So, yeah, today we're just going to quickly chat about the various ways that can be done. Um, and some of the things we need to take into consideration. So the first thing for me is, of course, safety when it comes to when you're actually traveling with your pet. Um, and I think the most important of that is that pets should be restrained in some way. It's really good to have cats in baskets if they're not used to traveling. Um, yes, you get your cat that loves to just sort of park off on the back seat and they're lying there on their backs and they're not stressed at all. That's the ideal, but the reality is that a lot of cats don't like that. Um, so it is better to put them in a smaller area like a basket, a covered basket maybe, um, and in that way they can feel a lot more secure. Um, and then dogs, of course, it's good that you can somehow be able to control them, so a harness or a collar is good. Um, of course, if you're traveling very far, we're talking about now cross-country traveling, by all means, um, maybe just the collar is fine, you don't have to have a lead, you don't have to necessarily... Um, you know, have the whole patoot on the whole time, but there must be some way that we can actually get hold of them if something should happen. Um, it's also really important, obviously, to, to not have them on the driver's seat. You need to be in control of your vehicle. Don't put them on the driver's seat. Um, I also, also actually advise don't put them even in the front seat on the other side, in the passenger seat. Rather put them in the back if you can. And very important, and we have had so many injuries from pets jumping out of windows, and jumping off buckies. Um, please be careful when you open windows. We all have the picture in our heads of the dog sitting with his head outside with a tongue um, flapping in the wind. Um, and they really do enjoy having a bit of wind in their hair, which is fine, but just make sure they can't get out. Um, make sure there's a way that they are being restrained. And um, it's not nice having a little doggy come in that's either been run over by a car or that's jumped out and broken his leg. And it's something that could have been avoided. Um, so that's, that's quite an important thing to remember. And then, of course, so there's a lot of pets that travel all over the country and that travel long distances as well. It's not necessarily just a quick stop to, to the beach or to the park. So um, on these long journeys, make sure that you, you cater for your, your pets as well. Um, we're talking here about um, and thinking things like comfort, make sure they've got enough space that they can lie down, that they can maybe move around a bit, a stop often, make sure that they can um, get out and stretch their legs a bit, just like you get a bit cramped and, and sore from traveling far, by all means, um, dogs and cats also do if they're just lying uh, or sitting in the same position the whole time. Um, so it's really good, stop often, give them a bit of a sniff, make sure that they, they have a bit of time to, to move around. Um, they can maybe have a lap of water or two. So that's also really important. And then finally, it's, it's good to have some emergency contacts of some sort with you. So if you are, for instance, if there is a, an incident where um, you are in, a, in an accident or something like that, 
it's good that someone can at least get hold of an emergency contact for your pets. Um, if it's a pet sitter or even your, your pet's medical records, maybe the vet, um, if your pet has got any actual illnesses that, that is important and that we need to take into consideration when treating these pets, it's good that there's some way that we can find out if there are any, um, any pressing matters that, that needs to be taken into account if a pet like that should be rescued or brought in after an accident. Now, it's also very important to look at health checks before you're traveling. Um, now, whether this is just locally in your parks or beach or whatever, it's nice. We live in the Cape, so we've got the beach right here. Um, but this goes for pretty much anywhere where you go, is to, to ensure that you've got tick and flea cover. Um, ticks are our biggest problem, actually, because they can transmit biliary and a tick bite fever. Both of those diseases are pretty common through the whole country. Um, and making sure that your, that your pets are covered is a really, really good um, thing to do. Also, vaccinations, especially rabies vaccinations, um, are actually required by law. So it's really good to make sure that they are vaccinated adequately. And especially if our pets are often exposed to, to different environments, vaccines really help us to prevent these diseases. And then health checks for pets, especially if they've got underlying issues like heart disease or respiratory disease, we need to take these things into account. Make sure you've got their medications if they've got chronic medications. Make sure you've got enough for your travels if you are going far and staying for long. Um, our heart disease patients, they can actually get, um, you, you can get worsening of their symptoms if they get super excited or very stressed for a long time. They're very prone to heat stress. The same as with our, our cats with asthma. Um, and we can actually get them in an emergency situation because of this heat stress. So, watch out that the car is not too hot inside, don't leave them in the hot car, make sure there's enough ventilation. And then just watch the, the older pets with arthritis, our big Labradors. Um, it's sometimes hard to get in and out, especially if you've now been lying there for a while. So just make sure that you think of those things that you can help them in and out um, and make sure you have a vehicle that you can transport your pets. If you've got a huge Great Dane, make sure that you can actually get the Great Dane in the car um, or have some sort of some way um, of um, being able to, to move them around if you should need. So our two main medical problems that we're often dealing with when it comes to pet traveling is motion sickness and pets that are nervous or anxious. Those are the two broad classifications. Um, and I think these are the two things that we can actually do things about. And both of these things actually have an impact directly on our pets as well as on ourselves. And I actually have um, my own little dog, you'll see him in a sec, um, that is, he is a little bit nervous when he travels in the car and he gets motion sickness as well. So I know how stressful it is for him because I can see that he doesn't like it. And I know how horrible it is for me to feel that he is going in this situation and he doesn't really like it. So, and then he vomits and it's all horrible. So just, it's really, these are the two things that we know can directly impact um, our relationship with our pets while we travel. So firstly, your patients that are motion sickness, um, or get car sick, they will be licking their lips. You'll see a lot of swallowing. Um, they can gag, they can actually vomit themselves. But very often after they've done that, they would actually go and relax. Um, the vomit episode is often just once off. Uh, they'll chill out after that and it won't be a problem anymore. Where our nervous or anxious patients would be more, they'll be restless, they'll be vocalizing, they'll be very excited, or they'll just sit there in a little ball shivering or they'll just be frozen with their eyes huge and the ears pulled back. And it's like they sit like that for the whole journey until they eventually get out. Um, so those are two of the things that we, that we often look out for. So this is my little pooch. His name's Darby. And you can see here, his eyes are all big. You can see the whites of his eyes coming out. His, his posture is quite withdrawn. His, his body is pulled low down. Um, ears are back. We can see he's not very happy. Um, so he, we do normally like short trips with him in general, we try and avoid the super long ones, um, without dealing with it more directly. So 
if we start dealing with these problems and motion sickness in particular, the first thing we always advise is to start getting pets used to the car. And I think there is a presentation about this uh, uh, later, so I'm not actually going to spend too much time on that. Um, but the best, best, best thing is from young, get them used to the car. You can also avoid feeding them for about three hours afterwards. Um, it doesn't necessarily take the sensation of nausea away, but it's a bit less to clean up. There'll be less vomiting itself. Um, so we do find that it does help a lot. Uh, pets that are nauseous um, and, and that are prone to vomiting will be a lot, it will be much more exaggerated if the stomach is full. And then it's also very, very important. Please come ask our vets, us as vets for help. There's so much we can do for pets that do actually get um, sick when they're in a car. Um, there's actual very, very safe medication that can be used to stop the vomiting. It stops the sensation of even feeling nauseous. Um, and it can also often facilitate them from getting used to the car. Because if you've got a patient that is that, that gets nauseous whenever they go into a car, you can very often um, actually get them to become very stressed. And there's a stress association with the car. So it's really good to rather use something to help them. Um, now, unfortunately, these medications are scheduled, so you're going to have to chat to your vet. Um, the over-the-counter things don't work, um, but please reach out for some help because uh, we really do want to do that. Now, when we're talking about our pets that are very nervous or anxious, um, again, we start with getting them used to the car. And this can be a slow process. Take it slow. Don't rush it. And you really want to get them used to it. You want to get them comfortable in it. And that goes for cats as well. We so often just think, travel in the car, dogs. Put the dog in the car, here we go. But we forget how anxious cats can be because they don't necessarily vocalize and freak out like dogs would. We're not always necessarily aware of how stressed they are. But cats can get extremely stressed. So it's very important to remember them as well. So this is a cat that was a patient of mine. And he had to travel to us very often. And when we started with him, he was extremely anxious when we put him in the car. So we started with a very slow process. And we started by just literally putting a box in the middle of the hospital. And he just loved getting in this box. And he was super chilled. We eventually moved the box to the car. And he started getting to the car in the box, lying there, chilled. And so we got him used to the car slowly. Um, and it really is, is, makes a huge difference. And you can see in his body behavior, he's so chilled. He used to sleep, sleep in the box on his back. He hardly ever went into a cage anymore because he was so, so calm. And, and it all started with just getting him used to um, the, the fact that he's going to be moving. You can also start um, after a box or something like that, move the cat over onto the actual carrier that they'll be going into the car with. You make the carrier such a nice place and nice bedding in there. You can feed them in there. You can put some treats in there. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do to make it a part of their normal, normal places that they, that they, that they can go to. Um, and that is what brings us, uh, it gives us that final breakthrough with them. And then also make the, make the car a fun place. Don't always just take them to the vet. Um, it's not nice always going to the vet. So make it a nice place to go to. This is incidentally my own dog. Um, and he just, he loves to get into the car. He used to go, he knows he, he's going on an outing or um, you can see he's relaxed. He's excited, mouth's open. He looks around. Um, so it's make it a fun place. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, treat motion sickness because it can increase your anxiety a lot. Now, there are two types of medications that we can use for anxiety in pets. Um, so firstly, there are a whole lot of natural products that we can use, and these come in tablet forms or capsules. Um, it's an amino acid that basically increases the serotonin, which is your feel-good hormones. Um, you also get collars and sprays that contain pheromones. This works really well for cats as well. And it just creates a little bit more of a calming uh, feeling in the pet when they um, get into the car. And of course, then um, they, they eventually create a positive association with the car. So they feel good when they're there. Um, it has a calming effect, but I generally find this only works really well if it's quite mild anxiety. 
they're not that nervous, but they are a bit. That's the sort of thing we would uh, often do. And it is over the counter, freely available, um, and it's very safe. So it's definitely somewhere where we can start. But as I mentioned, for the severe anxiety, often we have to do a little bit more. Um, and that's where it comes to actual prescription medication. There's a host of them on the market. It depends on the patient, on the, the length of the journey, the reason for it. Um, all of those things do play a role in what we would use. And these medications directly affect the brain and it relieves anxiety. Um, we don't really want to sedate patients that have to travel. Some sedations actually can make it worse. And we don't want uh, pets, for instance, if they're in a car or on a plane, they need to be able to brace. That car is moving, and uh, so you want them to be able to keep their footing while they're busy uh, traveling. Um, and some of these medications can be very fast acting, and we definitely rather advise these when we get to moderate or severe anxiety. Now, these all need prescriptions from a vet. You need a health check before uh, we can give these. So please reach out so that we can help with these medications. They do make a huge difference. Um, and these medications are really safe. They're not habit forming. Um, they can make a huge difference. Again, helping with the acclimatization phase, helping with those positive um, associations with the car. And over time, we find that we need less and less of these interventions as the pets get used to traveling. Um, so those are the things we can do to directly help our pets um, when we're traveling with them. So as a final thing, we can see this is um, actually a, a cat that stays at my, uh, my wife's practice. Um, and you can see he's just parking off in the car on the back uh, backrest. Um, he's so used to traveling. Um, he's actually a very, a very roamy cat. He likes to walk around. He doesn't like to be confined, but when you pop him in a car, he jumps up on the back there and he literally just wants to looks around and then just falls asleep. Um, and that's what we want. That's the ultimate goal. And we want to try and get there without all these interventions. And that's why we strongly advise from the start, get them used to it. But we don't often have that um, luxury. We might have a pet that's been adopted, that's already nervous, and we can then rather go on into helping them and then hopefully get there where they can be nice and relaxed. And I think, again, all pets will likely have to travel at some point. It's really important to be prepared. Um, and then if you see a problem, if you see your pet is, is um, nervous or vomits in the car, please reach out to us as vets. We do want to actually help. Um, we've often also got um, uh, behaviorists that we often work with, and we can give advice on how to get them used to it, but we really are a profession that's passionate about pets, and we want to help and make sure that our pets live the happiest and healthy lives that they can, and that they can enjoy all these things with their owners um, and with you as well.